Hey, let's give it up for our worship team today for leading us this morning into an amazing time of worship. And uh, we want to thank all of you that are watching us online as well. It's been an incredible week, and uh, we have been um, witnessing a miracle on so many different levels and so many different ways this week. Somebody in our, our church family who um, uh, unfortunately went through a um, very tragic situation with his um, setback with his health. He, a friend of ours um, here by the name of Steve Miller uh, in our church, in fact, it was on Sunday morning, uh, he had a seizure and was instantly airlifted, uh, taken to the hospital. And uh, long story short, after multiple procedures, um, today he is walking, he is just doing some incredible things that they didn't think was even going to be possible. And uh, the doctors who have been working with him and the surgeon that uh, did surgery, the second doctor that did surgery on him, uh, basically said, I'm dumbfounded, I don't even know what to say. And so God is at work. He's a miracle working God, amen. And uh, so thankful for the power of prayer and uh, God just doing so many incredible things. And I just... I know that when God is on the move and God is doing amazing things, there's always going to be little things that also come along that kind of throw you a little curveball where the devil just wants to say, oh yeah, <laughs> well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to take the joy out of everything that God is doing. I want to share something with you real quick before I get into today's message, and I don't want to uh, belabor um, this issue, but uh, many of you uh, maybe heard just a few weeks ago, just uh, even, I kind of just threw it out there, even in uh, passing in one of my messages, but we got a one-week notice um, never, several weeks back from the Orange County Public Schools, and Orange County Public Schools, uh, through an email, zero explanation, basically said, effective September 1st, uh, we're going to be uh, introducing new policies, procedures, and new fees uh, for Orange County Public School rentals. And so, in other words, churches like ours or anybody else that wants to come and rent a facility uh, at Orange County Public School, any high school, middle school, elementary school, um, here are the new rates. And, um, you know, instantly we began reaching out, trying to find out, is this legit? I mean, is this, is this, is this actually happening? And um, super long story short, uh, we ended up calling other pastors, getting confirmation from other churches and pastors that meet in different schools throughout Orange County. All of them are also confirming, yes, we're going through the same thing. We don't know what to do. Everybody's scrambling. And so what had happened was is that they had increased their rental rates, so much so that it is more than double the amount uh, when it comes to the rental fees to rent a facility. And so we have been trying to work through, um, you know, all of the, in, in protesting of all of this, uh, the circumstances with Orange County Public School. Uh, some of the other pastors and I said, hey, let's unite together. We're going to stand and see, uh, stand together. We're going to see if we can get an audience with Orange County Public Schools. In fact, if there's anybody in here today that has influence with the, with the school board, I would like, I would like to know who you are. Uh, because what we want to do is we want to get a we want to get an audience. We want to we want the Orange County Public School School Board to hear from faith-based organizations and churches. We want them to hear from us why their fees and why their policies don't even make human sense as it relates to what we do and how we do it. And so with that, um, we have decided because basically we have to. They forced our hand. So normally on a given weekend, on a given Sunday, we have a seven and a half hour window. That's what it takes for us to, and especially since we've gone to two services, but we've always had a seven to seven and a half hour. We only added basically uh, an extra, uh, extra half hour when we went to two services. But with all that said, uh, because of the new fee structure, we're going to have to now shrink it down to five hours. So because of that, effective next Sunday for us, we're going to have to go back to one service at 1030. So just like we were doing before we went to two services, we're going to go back to one service at 1030. 
And I know a lot of parents are saying, well, what, what's this going to, well, how's this going to affect our, our student cafe or with our students? We're still going to do our student cafe because there is nothing, in my, from my perspective, more important than investing in our middle school and our high school students. So they're going to come. They're going to come and uh, worship with us at the beginning of the service, and then they'll be dismissed when we do our time of welcome to go into the student cafe so that they can have their time together. Because God's been doing a great, great work in the lives of our students. We're so thankful for that. But all of that said, even by squeezing it into a five-hour window with one service, a five-hour window is still going to cost us approximately about $25,000 more per year than what we've been paying in the past. And so with that, that's how significant and radical the fee increase um, is. And so uh, we're going to take what the enemy is wanting to use to discourage us, and we're going to come back swinging, amen? Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I believe if, if God is for us, then who in the world can be against us? And so we're just going to keep on keeping on and do what God has called us to do. And we're going to go quench hell with a water pistol. Can I get an amen? So, uh, so well, listen, let's just be, let's be proactive, be in prayer about that. And again, if you have influence with a Orange County School Board member, I would love to meet you and talk to you after the service today. Well, we are starting a brand new series today called Jonah. Everybody say Jonah, Jonah. So today we're talking about Jonah. And uh, not the Jonas brothers, the prophet in the Bible by the name of Jonah. And um, I'm just curious, how many of you have ever maybe felt or sensed God speaking to you and leading you to do something? And you decided after hearing what it was that God was leading you to do, you decided you didn't want to do it. I'll raise my hand on that one. Come on, don't lie, we're all in church, all right? Come on, somebody. But seriously, we've all been there, right? It's like, God, are, are for, for real? I mean, what? Are, is, this, for, is this legit? I mean, are you serious? This is what you want me to do? But, you know, often that's exactly what God does. God has a way of speaking to us and leading us and guiding us in a direction that he wants us to go. But at the end of the day, it's our choice to obey or disobey. And so this is really, in a nutshell, the story and the circumstances of Jonah. In fact, let's go ahead and uh, open up. If you have your Bible app, you can open it up. It's a fascinating story. I encourage you um, to follow along. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And um, if you're not familiar with the book of Jonah, Jonah is a prophet, was a prophet. And Jonah, it's interesting, his name uh, in the Hebrew actually... Um, the Hebrew name for Jonah is the word dove or the peaceful one. And what's also interesting is that his father's name, by the name of Amittai, uh, his name actually in Hebrew is translated as truth. So he was a man of truth, a man who spoke truth. He has a son by the name of Jonah. Jonah, the peaceful one, should have been living a life of peace, speaking the truth. But as a result, he ended up making a decision to disobey God, and he ended up not experiencing peace in his life because of what God did through his disobedience. And we pick up the story in Jonah chapter 1, looking at verses 1 through 3. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. And here was his instructions. He said, go to the great city of Nineveh. And preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found the ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Jonah was a man on the run. You probably have seen this TV show called Cops. You know, bad boy, bad boy, what you going to do? You know, that man, he was, he was running. He was, he was running away from 
God. It was the last thing he wanted to do was to fulfill the assignment that God had given him. And what's interesting is that I think that we all, if we care to admit it, would agree to the fact that we can relate to Jonah because there's a little bit of Jonah that probably exists in all of us. There's a little bit of Jonah that creeps up within our hearts that we say, you know what, I kind of relate to this guy because God oftentimes tells me to do something or maybe I read God's word and I really sense the leading to, to do something or to obey something, but yet the fleshly side of me, the sinful side of me, the carnal side of me, says, I don't want to do it. And that's exactly what we find. It says in Jonah chapter 1, it says, the word of the Lord, everybody say, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. How many of you agree that God is a speaking God? He is. He is a speaking God. God, his revelation has been given to us through his word. That's what the Bible is. It is God's revelation. It is God's word. It is God breathed. It is God's infallible, inerrant word of God. It is God's revelation. God is a speaking God. And God speaks to us through his word. We speak to God through prayer. But not only does God speak to us through his word by giving us a revelation by what it is he wants us to know and to understand. But God also uses other ways. He'll often use other people to speak to us. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says he spoke the world into existence. In the Old Testament, often God was seen and known to speak audibly to his chosen people. For example, you take Moses. God audibly spoke to Moses through a burning bush there on the Mount of Sinai. And then we perhaps can remember where we read through the Old Testament prophets where God would speak through prophets to different nations and different leaders. And we see circumstances and we see miracles that God used to speak to the people to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. We often see in situations or stories like Elijah who was at a mountain and, and through this God told him to go there and, and God sent an earthquake but, but he didn't hear the voice of God and God sent a, a mighty rushing wind and God didn't, excuse me, Elijah didn't hear God's voice through the wind. He sent a fire and still not hearing the voice of God. And then the scripture says, through a gentle whisper, through a still small voice, God spoke to Elijah. And so sometimes it isn't always loud or isn't always obvious. It isn't always something radical. But maybe it's through, just through the gentle whispers that we hear the voice of God speaking to us. God is a speaking God. And when God speaks to us, there are four things that we're going to learn today that we need to understand as it relates to Jonah. Number one is that God will often ask us to do things that we don't want to do. And I think we can all agree to the fact. In fact, in Jonah chapter 1 verse 2, it says, here's, here's, here's what God told him to do. He said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So God specifically told Jonah exactly what he wanted him to do. It wasn't as though Jonah was a little bit confused. It wasn't as though Jonah was standing at the fork of the, fork of the road trying to figure out what God's will was for his life. It wasn't a, as though God was unclear in what his assignment was. No, God clearly spoke to Jonah and he said, this is what I want you to do. And upon hearing this, what's interesting is that Jonah unfortunately decided he didn't like the assignment that God was calling him to do. Therefore, he decided to rebel against it. It's interesting, God has a way of speaking to us. God has a good, pleasing, and perfect will. All throughout scripture, 
here's what you find. You'll find God gives us a precept, a command. Following that precept or that command is a principle. What's a principle? Principle is always a why behind the what. It's like telling your child, don't touch that hot stove. That's a command, right? That's a precept. But then there's a principle. Why do you not want them to touch the hot stove? Because if they do, they're going to get burned. But behind every principle, it also goes back to the person of God. His very nature and character of who he is. So because God is a loving God... And God has a good, pleasing, and perfect will through his revelation, through God's word. God speaks and he lays out exactly what it is that he wants us to do. How he wants us to live to accomplish and fulfill his plan and his purpose in and through our lives. That's just how God works. He wants us to walk with him He wants us to trust him, to walk by faith, and in relationship with him, he wants us to experience everything that he is destined for our lives and to fulfill his very purposes. So we can either choose to embrace that and agree with that, or we can say, God, thanks, but no thanks, I'm going to do my own thing. Well, Jonah didn't necessarily like the assignment. And maybe you can relate because there's a little bit of Jonah in you in the fact that maybe you've experienced some situations or circumstances through some friendships or maybe through the way you were raised with a mom or a dad. Maybe there were some people who hurt you. Maybe there were some people who spoke ill of you. Maybe there were some people or a specific person who did something to you and God has told you to forgive that person. But you know what? From your perspective, because of the hurt, because you've been wounded so deeply, you think to yourself, they don't deserve to be forgiven. And you still harbor bitterness in your heart towards them. Maybe it could be something very plain and simple like God says, obey me, honor me with the tithe. What is a tithe? A tithe is 10%, one-tenth of our earnings. We give back. The Bible says we return that one-tenth, that, that tithe to the Lord. Why? Because he's broken and needs help. Inflation has increased. <laughs> no. It's because he wants us to know, can I trust you? Are you willing to trust my precepts? Are you willing to embrace the principle behind the precept? Because I'm a generous God. That's his nature and character. That's who he is. And because of that, he wants us to trust him. But we say, whoa. God, I mean, I won't be able to make it if I do that. Maybe for some of us, we're in a relationship with somebody that we know is not living for the Lord. Maybe we are unequally yoked in a relationship with a guy or a girl. You're dating somebody who is not living for the Lord. You know it. And maybe from your perspective, you've been really wrestling about it in your spirit you know from the depth of your being you know there listen this is not God's will and yet you still choose to continue in the relationship maybe perhaps there is a series of choices that have been made that is culturally relevant and acceptable in the eyes of everybody else in today's culture And you have chosen to go along a path because it is culturally acceptable, but yet it is biblically wrong and unacceptable in the eyes of God. But we've chosen to go there anyway. And this is where Jonah's at. God will often ask us to do things that we don't want to do. He clearly heard from God. He knew what his assignment was. And yet the Bible says he ran. He went the opposite direction. Now here's what's interesting. Because after hearing all of that, when you understand what it was and who it was (laughs) that God was assigning Jonah to go and preach to and to preach against, 
It was a wicked group of people. It was the city of Nineveh. It was the capital of Assyria. And so here was a wicked group of people. I'm talking about these people were inhumane. These people were known. Their reputation had struck fear in the eyes of people around the world. People were scared to death because of the reputation. Let me give you a little bit of an example of what took place. The Assyrians were so wicked. In other words, when they took over a town and they, they took possession and they took captives, oftentimes it was so grotesque. In fact, even upon hearing the word, some towns, knowing they were about to be attacked, even the entire town would commit suicide because they would rather die that kind of a death than the kind of death they knew that was coming to them. To get, get more specific, here's what the Assyrians would do. They would rape women and little girls. They would torture children and then they would take often the husbands outside of the city and they would skin them alive and after skinning them alive here's what they would do is they would bury them in the desert sand up to their neck and then they would take their tongues and they would pull their tongues out and they would drive a stake through their tongue literally would drive these men crazy but through the pain and the agony and then once they died they would chop their heads off and what they did is they would make a pyramid out of the heads that had been cut off and what they wanted to do is they wanted to show the rest of the world exactly what would happen to them if they ever tried to attack and Jonah hears the word from the Lord and says I want you to go preach to those people so you can have a little bit of a merciful heart, a little bit of compassion towards Jonah. Say, well, heck, man, I don't blame that dude. I'd be, I'd, I'd be hopping on the, the next carnival cruise myself. I'd go chill out in the Bahamas for a few days, you know, and take a little Caribbean cruise. And who'd want to go preach to those people? But here's the thing. When God speaks to us, God never promises that whatever his assignment is or whatever his command is or whatever it is that he's leading us to do is ever going to be easy or may make sense. Tithing, does that make sense? On the human level, you could rationalize and justify and sometimes things just don't even mathematically add up. They don't make sense. Sometimes what appears to be okay or appears to be normal or appears to be the right thing to do, from our perspective, it's like, I don't get it. But God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. God sees from a different perspective. And because he sees and he knows and he understands things that we don't see, don't know, don't understand, when God says, I want you to do this, I want you to obey this, I want you to follow this, I want you to practice that, when God says these things, he does it for our own best interest because he loves us. He's got our back. He wants us to understand that if we do those things, we will experience his good, his pleasing, his perfect will, but it may not be easy. It may not be convenient. We may have to give up some things. Some, we may have to sacrifice some things. We may have to walk away from some friendships. We may have to walk away from some things that may be, you know, again, it may be inconvenient. But if we're willing to walk in the direction that God is leading us to take, God says, I will bless you for your obedience. But sadly and unfortunately, Jonah chose to disobey which really is a mark of his immaturity. Do you know how you know if a person is mature or immature in their faith? I heard someone would say it this way. It all depends on how much lag time there is. How much lag time there is between when God speaks and the distance and the time it takes for us to obey. Shorter the time and distance, the more maturity. The longer the time and distance, the more immaturity. And I think it's important that we realize we get to choose. We get to choose. 
So when God speaks, number one, we'll often, he'll often ask us to do something that we may not want to do. But number two, he'll, we can always find a boat that is also sailing in the wrong direction. In other words, we can always find a reason to justify our disobedience. We can always find somebody who will sympathize and empathize with the hardship or the sacrifice or the difficulty that maybe we will have to endure if we say yes to God's will. Somebody will say, well, you know what? Well, well I did it this way and it worked out okay for me. It's, it's easy to find a group who, a people or a group of friends who are living outside the will of God. And from the outside looking in, it's as though they got it going on. And like, man, life is good for them. It's always easy to find people or find situations or circumstances that will seem to justify why it's okay to disobey God. It's been said that sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. We can always find a boat sailing in the wrong direction. In verse 3 it says it this way, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish. Notice, to flee from the Lord. So, Josh, so, so Jonah, he was running from God. Some historians and commentators say that it was approximately about 2,500 miles away. In other words, God says, I want you to go east to Nineveh. <laughs> Jonah says, nah, I'm going to go west. 2,500 miles away from the target destination. Some commentators even said that it would take you approximately an entire year, 12 months, to sail that distance on the type of ships that those men sailed in those days. One thing is true. We can run from God, but we can't hide from God. And you know what, for some of us in this room, or even those that are watching today, maybe your situation isn't necessarily one who is outright blatantly running from God. Because obviously you're in church today, right? Hopefully you ran to church. But you know, most of us, I'd be safe to say, we're not necessarily running from God in outright defiance. Some might, but my prayer is that most of you are not. Chances are there's some who your disobedience may be a little different. Maybe your disobedience is more like drifting. Just casually going about life. And yet through being comfortable and casual, you've grown complacent. You're just drifting. You know how drifting works, right? Most people are drifting and they don't even know they're drifting because they're just going with a current and a flow that's taking you in a certain direction. The flow of that direction is taking you. And what's interesting is that there are other people that are moving in that same direction. So it seems right. In other words, it even feels right and it seems right that the direction you're going is right because everybody else is flowing in that same direction. It's called drifting. Michelle and I, we years ago went to Cancun, Mexico with her side of the family and we decided we were going to go on this uh, snorkeling cruise. And uh, so one afternoon, uh, you know, we boarded these little wave runners, went through this, like this little jungle cruise and then it kind of dumps you out in this big lagoon area and this beautiful area and so uh, we were going to uh, go sn snorkeling, and so the, the guy, the guide, he uh, gave us a little, you know, quick heads up, a little tutorial on what to do and what not to do, and he, he wanted to make sure that we were clear on where the boundaries were and the markers, and he told us something about, uh, that was very, very important. He called it the check-in and check-out check out rule, 
And he said, because you're going to be head down, you're going to be in awe of the beauty, you know, looking at all the fish and, you know, all the coral. And you're going to, you're going to be so caught up in everything going on underneath you. He said, you're going to forget to look up. To see where you are. He said that's called the check-in, check-out rule. He said because if you fail to check in, if you fail to raise your head, to look around, to get oriented to where you are. He said if you don't get your head up and check in, the current will cause you to check out permanently. And that's exactly what happens with a lot of Christians. Sadly and unfortunately for many, we're drifting. We're just drifting slowly, unaware. We're just drifting. Maybe moving further and further away from where it is that God has for our lives. Michelle and I, we wrote a book called The Family Shift. And a part of our introduction to that is we explain the drift. Disappointments distractions, and through all of those situations and circumstances, the busyness of life, the chaos, and the disappointments that sometimes comes with that can lead to isolation, or excuse me, it can lead to, to, to regrets. We begin to regret commitments we've made. We begin to regret things that we've neglected. We begin to regret, regret situations or circumstances we find ourselves in and as a result we begin to pull back which leads to isolation we feel alone trapped which only leads to frustration in our lives because things aren't going as we had hoped things aren't what they could be or should be which only amplifies the tension in our lives which causes stress and before we realize it this is a picture of people just drifting Drifting away from what could be or should be when it comes to living in God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so with all that said, one of the things that's so important is that we realize, number three, God may send a storm to get our attention. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 4, it says, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. So imagine for just a moment, here are these men on this great Voyager, this massive ship. It was probably a well-built ship. It was a cargo ship. And so here is Jonah now on this ship with these sailors. And these sailors all of a sudden are freaking out because of the storm. I mean, the raging wind and the, 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 the size of the waves. The, I mean, it was just, it was, it was so overwhelming. These guys were scared. They began to cry out to their little G-gods. And, and all of a sudden, during this whole situation, you know what? You know what Jonah did he's down below the deck he's asleep the captain goes and gets him he said man how in the world can you be sleeping through all of this he brings Jonah up to the main deck with the other guys they're they're all like man what is going on how how in the world what what did you do here's where we pick up the story in Jonah chapter 8 excuse me Jonah chapter 1 verses 8 through 10 so they asked him they said tell us Who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What did you do? Where did you come from? What is your your country? From what people are you? Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Well, this terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from, from the Lord because he had already Told them. These guys were freaking out. And they're like, man, you brought bad luck on us. What in the world did you do? <laughs> the God of heaven is ticked. And so here's the situation where Jonah realizes his sin had found him out. God sent this raging storm. And you know what? God has a way of getting our attention, right? God has a way of sometimes allowing us to get that reality check. But here's what we need to realize, that 
Sometimes the bad choices that we make or the things that we choose not to do when it comes to what it is that God's telling us to do, we not only bring a reproach upon ourselves, but we bring reproach upon other people. And that's sad and unfortunate because in, we're, we're living in this, this world and this culture today where Christianity has a serious branding problem. A lot of people in our world and our culture today are not real attracted to the double standards and the inconsistencies and the hypocrisies in the so-called church. And oftentimes those from the outside looking in, they will hear about a failure, a moral failure, or they'll see the inconsistencies of co-workers and they see maybe a lifestyle that causes them to kind of scratch themselves on the head say well that doesn't quite line up with what they said they were all about they begin to see all of these things and they begin to think well if that's what Christianity is all about why would I want that and that's the reason why Jesus said we got to be the salt of the earth. We got to live what we say we believe. We got to be the light to a world that's living in darkness. We got to shine boldly and beautifully and radiantly Jesus to a lost world. And the only way we can do that is to live out what we say we believe by being faithful and obedient to the things of God. It's the only way we can earn the trust. It's the only way we can earn the reputation and the credibility and authenticity with a world that's put a question mark in Christianity because of the reputation that's been stained by all of us. And I just want to say, in Jonah chapter 1 verse 12, Jonah said, it's my fault. It's my fault. And these guys were still trying to show a little compassion and mercy towards Jonah. And they even tried to row back to land. But they realized, man, there was no way. It was an impossible task. And so here's what Jonah said in verse 12. He said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And it will become, I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. And so as a result, these men through Jonah overboard. And the last thing I want to share is this. And I think this is true of all of us because Jonah's nightmare was exactly what he needed. In verses 15, to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights so therefore Jonah's worst nightmare running from God suddenly now being thrown overboard into a raging sea now is swallowed up by a massive fish and in that moment his nightmare became the very thing that God needed to get Jonah's attention God has a way of working in our lives to get our attention. And it could be through a medical diagnosis. It could be through a financial situation. It could be through a marital breakup. It could be through anything and everything, whatever it might be that God at times will allow to happen. Or maybe what God will, listen, will leverage a moment or situation or circumstance to say, now that I've got your undivided attention... Listen, listen. Some of us here, your nightmare may not be something that you've brought upon yourself, but it could be. Your nightmare is a situation that maybe you never thought would happen, but it's happened. Your nightmare of whatever it is, whatever it is that maybe you're going through right now. It might just be God's way of saying, listen, and speaking, and speaking.
speaking. And the question is, when God is speaking, what are we going to do? It's our choice. We can obey. We can disobey. We can agree with God. We can disagree with God. We can allow our hearts to be softened toward God. But we can allow our hearts to be hardened toward God. God's a speaking God. God speaks. Maybe through something radical. Maybe a gentle whisper. But God is a speaking God. And he'll do whatever it takes to get our attention. Why? Because he loves us. He wants nothing more than for us to be in his good, his pleasing, his perfect will. And it may be that he wants to take our mess and turn it into a miracle. It might be that God is going to take our time and our season of testing and turn it into a testimony. But it's our choice. And today, I just want to encourage you. If you're here today and you feel like you're drifting, or you're here and you're thinking, you know what, I can relate to Jonah. Man, there's a lot of Jonah in me because I've been running from God for a long time. Or maybe you have a son or a daughter or a grandson or granddaughter, or a friend that you know that's just living outside the will of God for their life. Whatever you do, encourage them to listen. God's a speaking God. And let's, uh, let's listen to what it is that He wants to say to our lives. Would you join me in prayer today? As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed for just a moment, I just want to say that if you're here as a follower of Christ, you're a believer, there's no question in your heart about your relationship with the Lord, but maybe as a Christian, you've backslidden, you've drifted, you've allowed just kind of the current, the flow of your current life to cause you to drift outside of where God desires for you to be. And in this moment, God is speaking to you. And maybe today you just need to say, God, give me ears to hear and eyes to see what it is you want me to do, what it is that I need to do. And maybe today it's just surrendering. It's confessing. It's letting go. And I want to give you that moment right now in your own words, in your own way, right there in your heart, to say, God, forgive me. Forgive me. God, give me a clean hand. Give me clean hands and a pure heart. Renew within me a right spirit. God, I want to go back to my first love. Some of you, maybe a, a friend invited you, and maybe it's been a long time since you've been to church. And maybe you're not even sure. Maybe you've been running from God and you came today because maybe you, you realize that God's been trying to get your attention. I just want you to know you came to the right place. And I'm glad you came to church today. And maybe what's missing in your heart is a relationship with a God who loves you. And I would invite you, if that's your need today, is to put your faith and your trust in Him, to make Him the Lord of your life. You can pray this prayer in your heart. Just say, Dear God, I confess to you that I am a sinner and I turn from my sin today. And today I believe that Jesus died and he arose again. And today by faith I invite Jesus into my life to forgive me and to save me. Thank you Jesus for saving my soul. 
As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you happen to have prayed that prayer just then, or maybe you prayed that prayer with us online, would you let me know today, just, just hold up your hand high toward heaven saying, yes, count me in. I just prayed that prayer and I'm ashamed to admit it. I just invited Jesus into my life today. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we thank you for these that lifted their hands. And God, we just celebrate with them for making such an important decision. And for those who maybe today are just renewing their hearts, Lord, they're returning to their first love. They're surrendering their lives. God, I pray that today, Lord, as we come close to you, you would come close to us. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen.